The News Round on Off The Ball with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. This is News Talk. Now you're very welcome along to the show. Champions League last 16. It's that time of the year. We have PSG against Real Madrid this evening. We have Sporting Lisbon against Man City. With Premier League as well, Manchester United at home to Brighton. What could go wrong? Graham Hunter is with us at half past seven. Brian O'Driscoll in studio from eight o'clock. And then on the football show, interesting piece from Matt Lawton in the London Times recently on the rise of cocaine fueled hooliganism across English football. So we'll chat to Matt about that just after nine. 53106, text number. We're at Off the Ball on Twitter. Anne Marie Donnell in studio. Hello. Hi, Joe. And Johnny Ward is with us. Johnny, how are you doing? How are you, Joe? PSG, Real Madrid, Champions League knockout stages. Quite a nice way for us to spend our Tuesdays and Wednesdays for, Wednesdays for the next couple of months, I think. It's not the worst. Um, obviously, this was after the botched draw in which um, this wasn't the original draw at all. They had to do the draw again. And um, it's just interesting to kind of read the... Um, you know the the previews of the game. Um, Real Madrid are they're they're really not expected at all to kind of feature at the business end um, of the Champions League. The the demise of Spanish football is quite something, Joe. And um, I, I expect Man City will take an awful lot of beating this year. I think this has been their sole aim. I think they can kind of half take their foot off the gas in the uh, Premier League with a view to this. And it'll be interesting to see how they get on tonight. But yeah, looking forward to the games. Matt Lawton on the way after nine. I think we sent you on the piece as well. It's quite an interesting piece. It was written in the last four or five days in the London Times. So the headline is Football Violence, Cocaine and Kids as Young as 12, the new face of hooliganism. So Matt Lawton spent time with the police over a given weekend. He reports from, you know, Nottingham Station where Grimsby town fans are arriving in and the train is absolutely uh, destroyed. It's covered in glass and urine and beer cans and empty sachets that had cocaine in them, it would appear. And police are waiting for the train to arrive with sniffer dogs. And first train, they get some people. Second train has been forewarned. So the uh, drugs are, well, I would presume, uh, wolfed down, as Matt Lawton suggests as well. And then the point is made more broadly that the UK Football Policing Unit said last month that there has been a dramatic escalation in violence and disorder at or around matches. It's up by uh, 47% uh, year on year in terms of incidents being reported. Uh, they're very concerned actually about the rise between Class A drugs like cocaine and violence. And they're mentioning as well uh, the new breed, the teenagers coming through who, and Matt Lawton makes the point as well, it's almost akin to grooming, you know, the older guard of the firms you know their heyday in the 80s and 90s they're now men in their 60s and they're uh, you know encouraging the younger kids to get involved and in some cases carry the drugs through some of the spot checks for them and then there's just this uh, very incongruous description of uh, Leicester City and there's families out for Sunday lunch I suppose and then uh, riots break out at the pub where the families are eating and I, I, I gotta say you read the thing so glad we just don't have this culture widespread in Irish sport as a starting point but the uh, the drugs aspect certainly jumps out it really does it's today is 27 years to the day that the Lansdowne Road riot took place it's strange that we're having this debate now because you know that was kind of English hooliganism and I, I'm not saying necessarily drugs were involved but um, it was a sorry sight and it was something that I really remember from my childhood and you, I don't know you, you wonder where this is coming from Joe because like I've kind of said before that I think Premier League atmospheres are actually they're very kind of they're almost a bit too safe like it's it's quite a nice experience to go to a Premier League game whereas if you go to games of the continent it's far more lively as a fan but this is this is a worrying trend and you do wonder how much of it has to do with people coming out of the pandemic and um, how that's affected either I don't know is it mental health or if it's, it's affected uh, people's patterns because it almost seems to have come out of nowhere and it's a really really stark piece some of the things and you know you mentioned some of these sad individuals like lads in their 60s who are still involved in these groups and these kind of effective hooligans groups and um, you know it's it's quite pathetic and the, the images that um, it, that are portrayed in the piece and the train of um, essentially just like loads of bags of cocaine basically being left behind and left behind on the platform as they try to evade the, the, the police it's it's really really stark and you know we we thankfully we don't have a problem with it in this country and um, I wouldn't say you know there aren't any drugs among fans at League of Ireland grounds necessarily but we've had nothing like this and um, I hope we never have. Mm. 
I guess the obvious point, Anne Marie, is that uh, you know we're not saying here uh, drugs is a football problem, particularly cocaine. It would seem over the last uh, decade plus, very much a societal problem here as well. So we're talking pubs, nightclubs, hell, walking down the streets, homes, any public space you care to mention. But certainly, it seems in the UK, it's uh, very much a problem affecting football, and it's now uh, part of the ritual for. A lot of people. Yeah, and I'd be interested to know as well, obviously, as a woman, how it affects women's um, participation in going to football, because I know that a lot of people who follow English football and particularly the English national side, when we saw the fallout of the Euros and what happened after the final, people saying that they wouldn't dream of bringing wives or girlfriends or young daughters to football games. And I'm always, obviously, for obvious reasons, interested when I go to football, um, the attendance that is female and the percentages. And just when you look at English football, particularly the national side, like the female audiences are striking because they're just so low like the percentage in the crowds is so so low and I like I'm not like playing a victim or anything here but it can be a really uncomfortable experience sometimes going to football as a woman particularly like the walk up to the stadium when you have that kind of massive crowd mentality and things are often said and you might feel like you're in a little bit of a vulnerable situation because the crowd is predominantly male and like you'd be f- afraid sometimes particularly at nighttime games that something might kick off and as you say thankfully we don't seem to have that here in Irish sport like I've never felt uncomfortable at a GA ground or a League of Ireland game but there have been situations where you might just be that little bit extra aware of the situation. Mm. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that, Henry, because like I've I've always pointed out, I think League of Ireland clubs have failed to attract enough women to games. You see, it's a big part of rugby now. But just going back to the drug situation, um, it was this was mentioned as well, Joe, in, in relation to English racing recently, where some English race meetings, particularly like the Saturday meetings, um, like cocaine abuse has been so transparent and so rampant. Um, you know, it's, there have been articles about it in the race and post. So. Something has happened to British society anyway in terms of, you know, this kind of yobbish, druggish culture that, that has kind of permeated football and racing and um, that has come out of the pandemic. I doubt the two things are unrelated, but um, it's very interesting to see where this is going. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say we're far behind. I did have the experience. I won't name the restaurant or the area, but uh, I look, I, I hate using anecdotal evidence, but sometimes it's all you have when it comes to these kind of issues. So it was out for uh, dinner and we were sitting outside. It was still at the stage where generally people were... Uh, sitting outside and at our table maybe 15 feet away on a very busy street people walking up and down uh, some guy kind of caught our eye because he was dressed in a tuxedo you know him and two or three of his friends and he was standing in the middle of the street and took out what looked very much like cocaine snorted it and put it very casually back in his pocket like didn't even kind of turn towards the wall to do it or walk away from the middle of the street and we were kind of talking about it saying was that happening 10, 15 years ago? I don't remember seeing it done that casually 10, 15 years ago. And we hear all the time there is an epidemic. And geez, one of my memories of the Euro 2020 final was like the Sky News sports news camera kind of trailing across the crowds. And several instances, you're just seeing people casually snorting what looks like cocaine in broad daylight. And it's not really a taboo thing at all. So again, it's a, it's a wider problem. It's not surprising it's popping up around sporting occasions either. Yeah, I, I guess um, I don't want to say it's been normalised, but yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, if has. we've been on if we've been on nights out in Dublin, um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be Dublin. Um, I think I, I, it'll be very interesting to see what the the figures of you know drug use in Ireland are out of the pandemic. Um, an awful lot of people were probably drinking more at home, and you know, uh, I, I I I don't know, but I I think people going back into pubs. You now I hope that this isn't um, you know the scene that was becoming quite prevalent really in recent years where on a night out in Dublin, you know, there was a frequently, and this has been mentioned in Lee Motter's head as piece in the race post about, you know, the queues for the toilets uh, were very revealing at the race courses. And often you go out in Dublin and it's similar and um, it's quite depressing, it has to be said. Yeah. Well, Matt Lawton on the way after nine o'clock on the football show and, you know, his piece, it's worth a read, but it, like it kicks off mm. on the, the 1039 train from Grimsby to Nottingham and sachets of cocaine everywhere on a Saturday morning, you know, and, and the train manager's in tears and she's been consoled by her, her uh, colleagues. So it's pretty grim reading. 
We should start the news round. It is brought to you by Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. So, Anne-Marie, Champions League. Yeah, and Manchester City continue their quest, Joe, to win the Champions League for the first time tonight. They are away to Sporting Lisbon in the first leg of their last 16 tie. Pep Guardiola's side lost to Chelsea in the final last season, but they are favourites to go all the way this year. Speaking ahead of tonight's game, Guardiola played down suggestions that the competition is a must win for them. I know how important the Champions League, we cannot deny it, but we take seriously every Premier League game. And when we saw how we behave against Norwich, it was the best proof that. Uh, we, we want to do it every single game. So we are in the Champions League. So it's an honor, a pleasure to travel to to Portugal to, to try to compete well and, uh, and try to win the game. On the pitch, on the grass, will dictate our chances. The rest, just speculations like for open, for read, for uh, right, for, uh, you know, to, to waste our time is okay. But as much we want, as much we don't want, at the end is the players on the pitch. And he was also asked if being able to un, or unable to win this competition with City, if that would or would not define his career. As a manager, not me, all the managers were exposed to get uh, punished in the way for the criticism when you don't get results. So not me, all the managers. So otherwise you have to decide to do another job, another you know, it's not absolutely a problem. So I know our standards. I know personally which one are, and I accept absolutely everything. And kickoff in the Portuguese capital is inside the hour at eight o'clock. At the same time, there's a glamour tie in Paris. That's as PSG host Real Madrid. To what extent do you think it would define his career, Johnny, if he didn't manage to win a Champions League without Messi? Um, I think in terms of the Man City kind of experience, um, you know, it, it would define them to some extent. They've become a great team, but they've become so great, you you almost take it for granted. I think his language is very interesting there, and often, you know, people who don't speak English is their first language, um, talking about himself being punished, but talking about how his players behave. Um, it's almost like the teacher, and you see, you know, as he mentioned, how they behaved in that win over Norwich, where they turned it on again after a rare failure to win of late, um, and you just contrast that to Manchester United and the kind of it's almost like the the pupils running riot and getting away with everything uh, you know in the old Trafford dressing room so um, that's Guardiola the teacher I, I think it I think it will define him to an extent the money that they've spent um, and I know other clubs have spent a lot of money but we've become so kind of um used to what they're achieving in, in the league. I think it'll be disappointing um, for Manchester City if they don't win the Champions League. And I think it will define them to an extent. I think it'll be the one that got away. And I mean, he probably knows that as well, regardless of what he says. Yeah, it's weird. It would be simultaneously maybe the most influential coach along with Cruyff ever, and yet it would be thrown at him. I think what doesn't help his case, Anne-Marie, is he's had a few strange nights at crucial Champions League junctures. Last year, you'd say, fine, got to the final, mm -hmm. did OK. These things can happen and that Chelsea team were in a great place. But in previous years, you couldn't actually look at Pep and say, geez, you really overthought this and did something odd. And so it's kind of on you a touch here. Yeah, and he looked visibly and physically annoyed in his press conference yesterday, answering these questions that are thrown at him now every year, this time of the year, every year. Like he was rolling his eyes, literally answering them. And it will define him if he doesn't win I'm it. Sure and he, he knows it. I'm sure he wants to scream, I did everyone win the thing. <laughs> I have won it. Shut up. Mm. You yeah, know? and then we're all like, "Oh, you won it with Messi." I don't think I would have won it with Messi. Well, maybe I would have actually. <laughs> Who knows? That's that's the unfair thing. Um, but you know, like the football he produced at Barcelona was about more than Messi, and yet he doesn't get the credit for it. So, if you poll like Irish football fans, do they want Man City to win this? Um, it'd be interesting to see the result. I I don't. I don't particularly like the way that. Um, I, I I think they're great to watch, whatever. But like mm. you know, just the background behind the way that they bought success, it doesn't really appeal to me. Um, and I'm not saying they're a complete outlier in that regard, but I don't get that much joy from their winning at all. I have to say. Yeah. It's striking when you ask people, genuine football fans, how much they've seen of City and nobody I know sits down and watches them much. Like, I've seen so mm. little of them. It's, it's, and is it just strange. me? Are they never on the Sunday? Like, I think Sky are on to this. They just always seem to be the Saturday, three o'clock, and we only see one of those games. Oh, interesting. I think they were half five this weekend against Norwich. I'd have to look at the stats. They're very rarely Sunday. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. Yeah. From being in here on a Sunday, they are. <laughs> I, I've seen very little of them. I'll hold my hands up. Yeah. We just see highlights of them. I've watched a lot of them, but it's generally the same match over and over again. Yeah. 
They're mm-hmm. boring. <laughs> it feels almost like their season kind of starts tonight. Yes, Because they're does. so irrelevant now in the Premier League. They're Oof. just going to go and win it wow. in a boring fashion. No, come on, they are. I mean, but Liverpool have kept it vaguely your, interesting anyway. Do you know, I was about to say I look forward to your Twitter mentions, but actually it'll be fine. No one cares. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, I'm sure City fans do. But yeah, I think you're right. And I, I, I suspect you're right as well on people not watching them as much as they should. Definitely when Barcelona were in their pomp, I made a point of watching them. Mm-hmm. But uh, City, if you miss them, you're not heartbroken. Oh, they won 4-0. Yeah. Okay. There, is, there is a bit of that. We talked about that. You don't check back. the fixtures and plan your evening around a Manchester City game. Probably not. No. Meanwhile, I mean, if you want to watch a all, hell, <laughs> all hell breaking loose, then Old Trafford might be an option this evening. Yeah, Manchester United have the opportunity to go into the top four of the Premier League. They host Brighton with kickoff at Old Trafford at a quarter past eight. United come into this having drawn their last three games. That's having initially led in all of them. Graham Potter's side, meanwhile, have been quite impressive this season. They're unbeaten in the league since mid-December. Spurs knocked them out of the FA Cup. Text in saying, what about Duffer letting Johnny Ward know what's what, says Tom. I mean, it was amazing. I even thought, actually, you thought it was amazing at the time. You loved it at the time. Sometimes this would be a, oh, Duffer schools journalist uh, type headline. Whereas, actually, I thought you uh, enjoyed the whole exchange a little bit as well. It was great. Uh, I don't know if everyone is, is I don't know if everyone uh, is on is aware of what you're talking about. It was the League of Ireland launch, which was kind of, um, you know, it was meandering towards uh, an inevitable conclusion. And Damien Duff was late because I think he'd gone to Abbottstown by mistake. Um, and I reminded of this when when I met him the first time, and he didn't take too well to that. Then he didn't shake my hand because he was blaming COVID. Um, everyone else shook my hand. But I was like, fair enough, COVID still exists. That was grand. Then the interview took place, went ahead. That was fine. And then then I said, oh. Well, you know, um, yeah, Shelburne, according to Damon Duff, a sleeping giant. He said, I didn't say that. I said it's a giant, not a sleeping giant. And then, of course, as everyone knows uh, on Twitter and Instagram, you can find something that you forgot you said a while ago. So Damon Duff actually did call Shells a sleeping giant in an interview a few months ago. It's kind of exonerated me, but um, I don't know. It was it was, it was was strange. I was kind of it was kind of in a bit of a trance in the whole interview, Joe. I was making the point afterwards. I don't actually remember anything he said. He, he, he spoke some big stuff in it, and I was, I was so kind of, I guess, I don't know, in awe or whatever I was just like I don't remember anything he said but um, it's gotten a hundred thousand hits for something that was so like <laughs> I thought was he recovered just well I, I, I just I'd, back down scared <laughs> yeah you should have seen how I've been the following week but anyway it was uh, if, if you didn't see it you can obviously get it online but Johnny had started his rap I mean the interview was over and he was concluding and you know sleeping giant and, and you could see Duffer look will I won't I and then he was like yeah. look, <laughs> you're bloody right I will actually and he went in two feet up, took you out and uh, walked away again. Said, uh, Saturday, Duff was talking to the FAI in this interview as well and that shouldn't be lost because he's never met me before and I doubt he's any reason to kind of, you know, um, have, a, have an issue with me. So he was sort of talking to the FAI and he did have the body language of somebody that was like, okay, I have to do this because he didn't really speak to anyone else there. Okay. Yeah, I got the impression of touch with him as well that Duffer, like he's very keen not to be cuddly character here like there's a real mm. there's a bit of an edge about him and there's like I'm not going to take any you know what and you know I'm not I'm not some kind of uh, not, attraction here for the media like a manager and we're going to have our elbows out I just got that vibe off him you know he, he's not going to be this friendly oh yeah listen I'm going to be a really uh, a media darling over the next uh, 12 months I, and I think he's kind of letting that be known now consequently he's going to be a huge media focus because it's box office in its own wonderful way he doesn't. He says he doesn't want to do interviews, but when yeah, he does right. them, he he mm. behaves like he does want to do interviews. So it's kind of um, he's slightly enigmatic as a person, and um, I think you know there is pressure on him here because if this goes p tong, it's it's a Shelburne job. It's not like getting a job in the championship or something. As much as he says they're a giant or whatever he said they were, it's yeah. still League of Ireland, and Shells have done nothing for a long time at this stage. You know, they're they're a small club in the in the in the overall schemes of world football. So it's if this doesn't go right, and he's he's placing stern demands on the players talking about dominating the ball for a team that's gotten promoted you know it's it's going to be difficult for him um, to come out of that and um, as much as he'll, he'll obviously get another job there is a bit of pressure on him and um, it'll be fascinating to see how it goes I can't wait Do you think he has a kind of healthy disdain for the media like in his in his private moments if you were to say to Duffer what do you think of like are you into journalism and do you like reading papers or listening to chat about sport I, I would strongly suspect his answer would be it's all a load of 
Well, we should all have a healthy disdain for the media, including sure. you and I, Joe, to be fair. Yeah, a strong disdain, strongly healthy disdain, <laughs> I think he has. Uh, somebody has texted in, Christina. Hi, Joe. I worked near Wembley Stadium in the mid-80s. It was a half day on Saturday, but we couldn't leave work till the match started because it was too dangerous. Guess things haven't changed, but gotten worse. I thought they had improved, is the thing. I thought that Premier League grounds in particular had become real family-friendly affairs and all seated stadiums and you would see the demographics changing. See, I, the problem with hooliganism in English football is you only need a very small percentage to yeah. cause hell breaking loose, you know? You don't need that many people to trash the train. No, did she say in the mid-80s? Yeah. Yeah, that's quite striking though. Like, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't imagine... Well, that so, was, yeah. I guess, oh, you know, peak yeah. hooliganism, I suppose, into early 90s. As Johnny, what did you say, Johnny? This day, was this day the Lansdowne Road one? 27 years ago, yeah. yeah um, amazing, yeah. amazing night. And you can, uh, I remember just watching it at home and thinking, this, this is great. Dave Kelly's given Ireland the lead here. Um, but I imagine for a lot of kids who were there that night, it was a frightening, frightening experience. And I think Jack Charlton was very, very hurt by it. Yeah. Mm. M- amazing footage of him on the pitch screaming, go home. So, Tiger Row. Two time champion Tiger Roll Joe will not run in the Aintree Grand National this year. Owner Michael O'Leary says he won't go for a record equaling third title over what he has called an absurd handicap mark. The Gordon Elliott trained 12 year old was handed a handicap mark of 161 today, the same given to last year's winner, Manella Times. That means he'd have to carry at least 11 stone 4 pounds after winning the race off 159 in 2019. O'Leary told the Racing Post this evening it's unfair on a 12 year old chaser and that they must remove him as they don't believe it is safe or fair to ask him to carry close to the top weight at that age. He will instead be trained for the co- cross country race at Cheltenham and there's every likelihood that win, lose or draw that'll be his last race course appearance. Johnny do you agree it's an unfair handicap? <sighs> Maybe, but you know, he, uh, like he's he's essentially dropped him five pounds. Um, I think I, I I I'm I was very much against the British handicapper um, before this in terms of the way he dealt with Irish horse, but I think this is a, a load of nonsense from the O'Leary side. To be honest, they've they've campaigned him over conventional fences, probably partly to get his mark down, but they objected to run him in the race last year. Um, and obviously, you know, he's he is a twelve year old, but this stuff about him carrying top weight, I don't buy it at all. I think it's it's egos at at stake here, and he should be running the race quite simple. He showed, as the handicapper mentioned, he absolutely bolted up in the cross country race last year, so that would seem to imply that he wasn't far off his best Gordon Elliott has said he's edging back into form there's no reason at all not to run him in the race if he if he doesn't win that's fair enough but I don't buy this animal welfare thing at all he's, he's ridden uh, he's carried heavy weights before um, he's 12 years of age but don't buy it OK Tagburn he says it was an easy decision to sign a new contract with the IRFU the Munster forward agreed a deal until the summer of 2025 today Byrne was at Leinster and Scarlets before joining the Southern Province in 2018. He has 27 Irish caps and featured for the British and Irish Lions last summer. Elsewhere, former Munster out half JJ Hanrahan is set to join the Dragons at the end of the season. The Kerry native has put pen to paper on a long term deal. The Welsh side confirmed today he'll arrive from Claremont, where he has made 14 appearances this season. That was after joining last year. We'll have to get around and cover your next story maybe on the show tomorrow. I just haven't been able to find the time to dig too much into it, but it seems like an extraordinary situation. So we're talking here about Camilla Valieva. Yeah, 15-year-old Russian Camilla Valieva was left in tears at the end of her figure skating routine as she launched her bid for Winter Olympic gold today. She was allowed to compete in Beijing after a court cleared her. That was despite a positive drugs test. Valieva stumbled on a jump but is first in first position ahead of Thursday's free skate. There will be no medal ceremony if she finishes in the top three as the case hasn't been fully resolved as of yet. So what's happened here? So she has tested positive for a banned substance, but because she's 15, she's actually protected by her age. So that's how she was allowed to compete. 
but when she went out and competed today, oh, it just looked like such a sad, lonely place for her. Like it was just a horrible situation. And the Russians are claiming this as a victory for them. She's probably the best figure skater in the world at the moment, mm. if not ever. She's been um, training since she was three years of age. She probably would have won this tournament or won gold at the Olympics without needing to dope. She's 15 years of age. It doesn't seem that she went on the internet and bought the banned substance. It seems it was given to her. She's lost respect amongst her fellow competitors. Um, and it seems like she is just the pawn in the middle of this situation that will go further to the court of arbitration for sport and it doesn't, if she wins it probably will be stripped of her but she probably did deserve to win it which is just the saddest thing of all. And do we know if she knew she was taking illegal drugs in so much as a 15 year old has the cop on or not the cop on but did she know what she was taking? Well that's what hasn't been disclosed because her team claim that um, she tested positive because she shared a glass of water with her grandfather and it was heart medication that he's on so that's how it ended up in her system so obviously we don't know if she knew like yeah. as in they haven't told us the if, full if that's yeah. what happened that's, their, that's how they're claiming that's how they're claiming okay. it but people that follow skating um, in a far more specific way have yeah. stated that at 15 years of age she more than likely didn't know mm. Okay, we might cover that tomorrow if we can find time. Seems like an extraordinary situation. And she was generally shunned by all fellow competitors today. Yeah, so she has lost an awful lot of respect for people um, or from fellow competitors, people calling for her to be taken out of the competition. And then she skated obviously better than anyone today, but in an ironic sense, it was probably her worst skate in a number of years and she cried afterwards. Okay. Guys, we're out of time. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie, thank you. Thank you. Johnny Ward, pleasure. Johnny, thanks a mil. Thanks, Joe. Your chance to win big. News Talk's Cash Machine. So, time for another rollover. Could you be our next winner? If you fancy being in the draw to win €28,647.31, here's what you need to do.